happy Sabbath. My sermon this morning is entitled White Tape. History often brings us the greatest lessons. One such lesson comes from an event in World War II that you probably already have heard about. It's the Normandy Beach Invasion, or D-Day. This was arguably one of the more important turning points in the war for the Allies as they went on offense aiming to retake France and ultimately Europe from Hitler's forces. You probably know the story. The Allies planned for two years for the operation, codenamed Overlord, which was a mass massive amphibious assault on the, of the French coast, straight into the teeth of entrenched German positions, complete with buried mines, razor wire, vehicle barriers, and fortified machine gun and artillery artillery positions. Many men died as waves of soldiers jumped out of the landing boats and hurled themselves into machine gun fire. More were grievously wounded and killed by those landmines as they won the beach and attempted to take the hill overlooking it. The heaviest casualties obviously came from the first waves of brave men, many of whom discovered the hidden mines by stepping on them and dying. As they progressed in the operation at great cost, they began to clear safe paths through the minefields and obstacles, which engineers marked with white tape that basically signaled, follow through here. And so paths were laid for those who came behind at the cost of blood and suffering and young lives, ultimately resulting in the beach being taken and the war turning. White tape, keep this in mind as we go on. This morning, I want to start by going to Hebrews 12, 1. Can someone read our scripture reading again for us? Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, see, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This verse brings up a few questions. The first being, what are witnesses? When we look up the word witness in the dictionary, it means person or thing able to give evidence, person who saw something happen, evidence, testimony, or testify. Here in Hebrews 12 verse 1, we see not just one witness, but a great cloud of them. These are people able to give evidence, testimony, and testify about something that they saw. Now do we understand the power of a witness? Most people are more likely to believe something if they know that someone else saw it, too, and even more likely the more people that can testify of it. We know that these witnesses have something to tell, but who are they and what do they have to tell? Let's start by asking the question, who are these witnesses? To answer this question, we need to go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Here we see Paul introducing us to a few of the witnesses, men like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Isaac, and women like Sarah and Rahab. Now we need to ask, what are these faithful witnesses witnessing about? Before Paul introduces any of these witnesses in Hebrews 11, he says, by faith. Now, if these men and women had faith, what was this faith? What did they have faith in? Let's read Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They were testifying of a faith in someone they hadn't seen but believed in. They testified of a faith that although they couldn't see him, they had seen him work. They testified in a God that could do things that had never been done before, like a flood, going to a place they had never seen but believed in the promised land, having a baby when they were well past the time to do so and had never had a child before and yet did. We see the faith of a harlot that believed and was saved from the 
falling on the wall of Jericho. And this is just a few of the stories of the witnesses. They were witnessing about how you can believe in something you can't see. Going through Hebrews 11, you can see how these men and women stayed faithful to a God they couldn't see and believed that what he said he would do. And in many of the stories, we see that it wasn't easy for them. Abel was killed for his witness. Noah had to deal with the mocking of men for 120 years. Abraham and Sarah waited for the promised son for 25 years. Rahab had to wait for the wall to fall. <clears throat> Joseph reminded the children of Israel the promise of their departing, even though it would be after his death. And Moses had to uphold his faith in the midst of the throne of Egypt as, and in the midst of a murmuring nation. Why do we think that it will be any different for us? People are going to hate us, murmur against us, mock us, and we're going to have to wait for God not only to help us, but also to fulfill his promises. We must not become impatient, for we have a witness. Someone has already laid the, a different kind of tape for what happens when we do become impatient. From Abraham, his life got a little messy with his unpromised son. Our witnesses are telling us that we need to have patience. When we continue re reading in Hebrews 12:1, it says, so great a cloud of witnesses. It makes me think of a storm cloud moving in and you're surrounded by it. In Hebrews 11, Paul only had the time to say a few names to his readers. He only, we only see the names of nine people. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and Rahab. Now, think with me. That we are walking into a court case today with nine eyewitnesses to an event. Which side do you think the jury will side with? I'm pretty sure the jury would side with the nine eyewitnesses. These nine testimonies are faithful men and women, but Paul doesn't stop with them. Can someone read what Paul says in Hebrews 11:32? And what shall I say, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Paul doesn't have the time to tell of all the faithful men and women. The cloud is too big. When I think about what the witnesses are witnessing about their faith in God, it makes me want to make the question clear. Were all these witnesses taken through the same tests or experiences in their lives? Is this cloud full of cookie cutter people? Can someone read Hebrews 11, 33 through 38? Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed <coughs> valiant to infight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resur resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourges, scourges, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in the mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. In these verses, we see the experiences of men being saved from lions, fire, <coughs> getting promises and strength. We also see the experiences of those that were killed, tried, tempted, and afflicted. These men and women went through different experiences in their lives, and they all stayed faithful to God through those experiences, whether they were good or bad, whether they understood why or not, whether they were to live or die. I wanted to make this question clear because often we read the Bible and we think, we could never do that. We are so different. 
We, aren't, we weren't raised like Daniel and his friends were. We aren't the promised child. We, we were never a captive in a foreign land or never walked through a parted sea. We aren't a king like David or a queen like Esther. We have never had to run to save our lives for truth or because we are the next king. God didn't fill the Bible with people that had all the same experiences because we are all different personally as people and our lives are different. We don't have all the same troubles or trials, but he knew that there would be another person with the same personality or experience as Abel, Moses, Sarah, Ruth, Peter, or Thomas. And he put them there to show that if they could be used, if they could have faith in him, so can we. They are our examples. We all will or have gone through different experiences that have had both good and bad effects on our lives. But we can look to those witnesses that have walked before us and find one that has had a similar experience to our own and find encouragement. Hebrews 12.1 continues by saying, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. We are called to do the same as those that came before us. They laid aside every weight and sin we must too. The meaning of the word weight is burden or impediment. Taking this into context of the verse, the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, says, It refers to the weight of anything extra or excess, such as clothing, which might tend to hinder or handicap the runner. The writer leaves it to each reader to discover what may be hampering his progress as a Christian runner. In this race, every entrant may win, for he is not competing with others, but with himself. He is not required to excel his competitors or to surpass a mark made by some previous contestant. Self is his only competitor, and the only requirement is that he exercise faithfulness and patience in his contest with self, and by the grace of Christ overcome every weight every tendency to evil. Ellen White continues this thought in Acts of the Apostles, page 312. It says, Envy, malice, evil speaking, covetousness, these are weights that the Christian must lay aside if he would run successfully the race for immortality. As Christians, envy, malice, evil speaking, and covetousness are some of the things that hinder our race. These are the things that we must lay aside, or we will never get to the finish line. When it comes to sin, Hebrews 12.1 says, The sin which so easily besets us, this must be different from the weight that must be laid aside. In Letters and Manuscripts 16 by Ellen White, it says, A lack of faith in Christ as our sufficiency is a sin which so often and so easily besets us, causing the fall of many. Lack of faith in Christ as being sufficient or enough is a sin that so easily besets us. Lack of faith in Christ isn't something new. It started in the Garden of Eden with Eve. Lack of faith is what Christ says, does, or will do is a problem that humans have. We go through the Bible and we see men that lacked faith in Christ in important moments. Men that jumped off the white tape for a moment. Men like Moses, Elijah, and Gideon, but their faith came back. They found their way back to the white tape. But there are also men that lacked faith in Christ that never came back. Men like Cain, King Saul, and Judas. This lack of faith in Christ is something that can be overcome. It can be laid aside just like Moses, Elijah, and Gideon did. We need to set our lack of faith aside so we can run with patience the race that is set before us. When we look at this part of Hebrews 12.1, there is one word that sticks out to me, and that is patience. When we look at this word in the English language, it gives the verse a different meaning. It seems like there is some waiting going on, like they are taking their time to get to the end of the race. But when we, when we understand the Greek meaning of the word, which is endurance, we get a different meaning to this verse. Endurance shows a struggle. It's a struggle to remove the weights and sin in this life, much like each mile in hills a struggle in a marathon. 
We need to be willing to endure the race that is set before us. Moses, Elijah, and Gideon had to be willing to endure through the situations they were in. They could stay in their unbelief, but instead they endured through it. They could have stayed at the bottom of the hill, but they didn't. Oops. It's important to also remember that it says run, not walk, not stand in place, not slow motion, but run. With this, it's also important that everyone runs at a different speed. But no matter the speed to run any race requires training, learning. Many think that running a marathon or running on a track team looks easy at first, but they soon find out it takes training. It takes understanding when to run faster and when to hold back, when to, what to do when running up a hill or how to let your body react to coming back down. For us in our Christian walk, it is the same. We need training for the big test. Our training here on earth are trials, afflictions, and temptations. Isaiah 48, 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. In Ministry of Healing, page 471, Ellen White adds, The fact that we are called upon to endure trials shows that the Lord Jesus sees in us something precious that he desires to develop. Many people go through different kinds of tra training, and in the moment, they have this feeling like their trainer is trying to hurt them or torture them. But really, it's because they see something that needs to be developed, that if it's not, when they need it, it won't be there. And we also need training on how to understand what to do in good times, the easy times, like when a runner is going downhill. Now, I want to go back a little in Hebrews 12, 1 for a minute. Paul uses the phrase, cloud of witnesses, in connection to our race to show us that we can run this race because others have done the same. In Paul's time, it was those in the Old Testament that were the witness. Hebrews 11, Paul could only use those in the Old Testament. But if you think about it, if the cloud of witnesses was great in Paul's day, it is an even greater cloud today. Or you could say we have more than one great cloud of witnesses. We have the witnesses found in the Bible in both the Old and New Testament, the early church, the Protestant Reformation, those in the Millerite and the Advent movement, on top of the people in our own families and friends that have been witnesses to us. We have witnesses that have gone through every kind of trial and temptation, that have gone through persecutions and disappointments, we have stories of so many men and women that never gave up and endured till the end. They are a great encouragement to us that if they could go through hardships, we can too. This reminds me of a part of one of Ellen White's visions called The Narrow Way. In Christian Experience and Teachings of Ellen White, page 182, paragraph 2, she says that she is walking down the narrow way. I noticed that the beautiful white wall was stained with blood. It caused a feeling of regret to see the wall thus stained. This feeling, however, lasted but for a moment, as I soon thought that it was all as it should be. Those who are following after will know that others have passed a narrow, difficult way before them, and will conclude that if others were able to pursue their onward course, they can do the same. And as the blood shall be pressed from their aching feet, they will not faint with discouragement, but seeing the blood upon the wall, they will know that others have endured the same pain. The pain and suffering that those that went before us experienced helps us know that we are not alone. Others have gone through the same experiences and understand that we are what we are going through. It helps us know that we can keep going just like those that came before us. Doesn't this remind you of the Normandy Beach invasion or D-Day? When the second, third, fourth, etc. groups of men got on the beach, they saw the evidence of those that came before them. Soon they saw the white tape, and I believe many were encouraged to keep going because of the witness of those that walked on that beach before them, and they wanted to live up to what they had started. Now I'm not sure, but with my limited experience, I have learned that many don't take or don't listen to evidence. 
There is a possibility that not every man that walked on that beach listened to the white tape and went off the path. They would have been a witness too. We too have evidence of these kinds of witnesses. We have a witness of those that walked away from the white tape. They fell off the narrow way. They are another cloud, a black cloud. As we all have read and soon we will look at again, Jesus is at the head of the great cloud of witnesses. But with this black cloud, we have Satan at the head. Then we have men and women like Cain, King Saul, Ahab, Jezebel, Judas, Herod, Pilate, Bloody Mary. And we also have many witnesses of those that were strong for truth, but when disappointments or hardships came, they gave up. Many from the Millerite and Advent movement. Joining in this cloud are the men and women that thought they had truth and weren't willing to listen when they were shown they didn't. We may have even had an experience where we thought someone was part of the great cloud of witnesses only to find out that they have been leading you down the wrong path into the black cloud. The black cloud is dangerous. We need to understand this path to make sure we don't fall into the same traps. As we are running this race and watching those that have gone before us, there is someone we are all following, and that is Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus. Why are we looking to Jesus? Because verse 2 continues by saying that he is the author and finisher of our faith. What is an author? The SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, says the meaning of the word author is leader, originator, founder, pioneer, prince, or captain. These words remind me of one word, and that is creator. He is the creator of our faith. He is the reason that we can have faith. Verse 2 also says he is the finisher of our faith. The SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, it shows that the meaning of the word finisher is perfecter. Jesus is working on perfecting our faith. In Hebrews 12, 2, we see the beginning and the end. We see the beginning of the white tape and the ending. It's also important to remember that finisher and perfecter shows that he has never left us alone. He has been writing our story all along. How is he writing our story? Where do we start our story? I believe our story started when Jesus made the plan to come and die on the cross for us. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. If Jesus hadn't have died, our story of faith, salvation, peace, and healing would never have happened. It never would have even started. If this is the beginning, what is the ending? He is called the perfecter of our faith. When will this perfection be complete? It will only be completed when Jesus returns for those that stay faithful. In the middle of talking about the witnesses, we have Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. It is in the heavenly sanctuary that Jesus is working to bring us to perfection and finish our faith. We get the sanctuary view in Hebrews 12, 2, when it says, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And in Revelation 7, 15, it says, Wherefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple? And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. God's throne is in his sanctuary. Here is where Christ is finishing our faith. Continuing in Hebrews 12, it says in verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. As we are running the race, we need to consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. From verse 2, we understand that this him is Jesus. Why is it that we need to consider Jesus? Verse 3 says, Least ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Why would we be weary or faint? The easiest answer is that we think that what we are going through is the hardest thing anyone in the world has ever gone through. We focus on what we are going through. We, we forget that no matter what we are going through, there is someone that went through something worse for us. In the SD Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 482, it says, 
No Christian is called to undergo a more strict course of di discipline than Christ was. By considering the way in which he met trials and temptations, we can avoid growing weary or faint-hearted. A glance at the burden Christ bore will make our burdens seem light by comparison. If we will only look unto Jesus and consider what he endured, every difficulty and disappointment we meet will be easier to bear. Jesus is an even greater witness or example than those that have come before us. We all go through things in our lives that seem so overwhelming. For some, it could be dealing with the death of a friend or family member, others raising kids or taking care of parents. Others, it's bills they don't understand how they're going to pay. For others, it's school assignments and tests they don't understand how they're going to do. For some, these things may be big or small. But comparing them to what Jesus went through, they are small. Jesus, in his 33 and a half years on earth, dealt with the death of an earthly father and separation from his heavenly father. We also know that he dealt with the death of a cousin. He raised 12 disciples for three and a half years and dealt with one betraying him. He made sure his mother was taken care of. He didn't have much money and often relied on friends for food. I also think Jesus dealt with school assignments, or better yet, you could call them certifications. You may be wondering what I mean. Did Jesus have to do homework or take a test? Well, no, but he did have people asking him questions all the time. I remember thinking of this when I was at Heartland, and I was dealing with tests and papers I didn't know how to do. Then I thought about the classes I and others were taking, and God said, Jesus took those. At first I thought, how? Then it came to me as I was looking at the classes we all have to take. He did take early, middle, and latter Old Testament, principles of self-supporting work, mental health class, biblical apologetics, Bible work, and health outreach. And these were just to name a few. His tests were brought to him by the religious leaders. And you could say his disciples brought him his homework. And with this, I knew that his midterms or finals were way more stressful than any Heartland class. One wrong word and it could have brought him to the cross even sooner. I have never taken any classes that, would, that could end up like that. And these were just a few of the hard things that Jesus went through. Could someone read Hebrews 12, 3 again? This verse leads us to the word contradiction. Another word for contradiction is hostility. Putting this word in the verse helps us to understand it better. It would say, for consider him that endured such hostility of sinners against himself. As I brought out about Jesus' school assignments, he endured a lot of hostility from the people and religious ru rulers. When we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, we don't see a time when he had complete peace. He endured hostility from most people he came in contact with. When you put this into perspective, sinners were and are hostile to the one person who can save them. Jesus endured hostility from the people he was seeking to save. Can you imagine with me that you have the power to free a man from a crime he was guilty of doing? But every move you made, he met you with hostility. What would you do? Would you keep trying to help the man, or would you eventually give up? Many would just give up. This isn't a surprise to us. Many would say, well, he deserved it. He was guilty. You were trying to help him, and he fought you at every step. The problem is, isn't this what we do? We are hostile towards Jesus. We fight him at every step, and he is the only one that can proclaim us guiltless. We need to take a different path than the people in Jesus' day. Set aside hostility and accept Jesus, and let him finish our faith. We also need to take the example of Jesus and be willing to help others and share the gospel with them, even when they aren't treating us right, or seem to be tempting us at every turn. 
In Hebrews 12, 4, it says, Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We start seeing a change in metaphor from the verses before. We still do see the idea of cloud of witnesses shining on the Christian, but in this verse, we now see the push or encouragement for them to join the fight. They have not experienced what evil can really do. They haven't yet joined the combat of battle against good and evil. They haven't followed the example and witness of those that have gone before them. They aren't using the white tape set out for them. When it says, resist it unto blood, striving against sin, it seems like it would be easier to understand if we turned it around and added just one word. It would say, this striving against sin, even resisting even unto blood. This is saying they needed to resist sin and be willing to uphold truth and die for the truth. They needed to be willing to never renounce the truth, but rather die for what they believed to be true. The people Paul was talking to hadn't gotten to this point yet. They hadn't looked to the examples of those that came before them and become willing to hold to the truth no matter what. Our greatest example of striving against sin is Jesus. He strived against sin in his life during his time in Gethsemane and at the cross. Jesus gave us the greatest example of what it looks like to resist sin. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says that we have so great a cloud of witnesses. We have so many stories of martyrs that lay down their life rather than to give up the truth. We have stories of men and women willing to martyr their reputation for the truth of the second coming. They were willing to give up all, many even life for the truth. They won the battle against sin. Now it is our turn to follow the example of Jesus and those that walked before us. It is our turn to use the white tape. It's our turn to set the white tape for others. Those that have followed him before us have set an example for us on what it looks like to follow Jesus. Hebrews 11 and 12 remind me of the song, Find Us Faithful by John Mohar. It says, We're pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us line the way. Encourage, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives are stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race not only for the prize. <laughs> But as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. Oh, may all who've come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children shift, sift through all we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. I remember talking to an atheist for a school assignment a few years ago. I was doing an apologetics class and had to ask him a few questions. I remember one question clearly that I asked him and his answer impacted me a lot. I asked him, where do you find your purpose? He was very clear with me and he said, Christians ask me that all the time. I tell them I find it in my kids, my work, my music, and he kept going on with things like this. I remember thinking to myself, someday his purpose is going to die. Most likely his music would be forgotten by the time you get to his grandkids, and if he's lucky, his great grandkids. And over time, he would just be a name to most of the world. But when I thought about the purpose of Adam, I realized his never died. His purpose was to tell others what Jesus was going to do one day. Tell all about creation and the time he had spent with Jesus. His purpose is still going on today. He gave his purpose to Seth, who gave it to his son, who over time made it to Noah, Abraham, Moses, Daniel, Jeremiah, Matthew, Paul, Timothy, Martin Luther, John Wesley, William Miller, James and Ellen White, Jane, Jane Andrews, and so many more till you get to today. 
Out of my talk with the atheists, I realized that we can be connected to the purpose of Adam. So we are no longer a dot, but a line, or you could say, white tape. Today, we are looking to the witnesses, someone who laid out the white tape before us, just like one day long ago, like those in Hebrews 11 did. But one day, we may, we may be laying out the white tape. Maybe even today we are. Really, in reality, if you are a grandparent, a parent, a sibling, a husband, a wife, an aunt, an uncle, a friend, a Christian, or even a stranger, you are already a witness. You're already laying out the white tape. Your life can either point others to God or lead them away. It can either be a part of the gray cloud or the black cloud. The question is, what kind of witness do you want to be? What cloud are you representing today? And what about tomorrow? Our closing song is 304, Faith of Our Fathers. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the comfort of knowing that others have walked the same path before us, that they have laid out the white tape. Thank you for giving them as examples to look to of what walking by faith means. And thank you for being the greatest witness to follow. Please help us to be true and faithful witnesses for you. As someone that is listening is struggling with what kind of witness they are, please help them to be willing and able to set aside what is hindering them from being a faithful witness so that they can lay down the white tape for you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.